Welcome to the Learning Reinvented podcast brought to you by myself, Katie Godden, and the team at The Learning Effect. There are lots of learning podcasts out there, so we wanted to do something slightly different. This week, we're talking about sport and learning. I'm delighted to welcome Paul Miles to the podcast. Thank you for joining me, Paul. Would you like to introduce yourself to our listeners? Hello. Uh, so I'm Paul Miles. I'm the CEO and founder of a new concept called In the Swing Leadership. Awesome. Thank you very much for joining me, Paul. Can you explain a little bit more about your background and how you got into learning? Yeah, so I my my journey, like so many uh, learning professionals, I think is quite quite a squiggly line. So I, I, I moved into my journey into leadership development from a place of being a senior leader in uh, in like a, a market leading organisation. So I'd I'd been in senior positions at organisations such as Tesco, the National Lottery, and I was delivering good results in my roles, but I didn't really know how I'd got there, if that made sense. I got there through hard work and and delivering and then being offered the next opportunity and, and working my way through, but I wasn't really sure what I'd done. I became quite disenfranchised with what I was doing. So I had an opportunity to to um, develop a coaching skill set and, and complete a coaching course. But as part of that, we used a strength scope profiling tool. And I was introduced to what my strengths were. For those who don't know what they are, it's around focusing on your strengths. And your strengths are things that energise you, not necessarily things you're good at. But the concept being that if you're really energised by something, you'll do a lot of it and you'll naturally be a little bit better at those things. My strength scope told me that I was about developing others, developing myself and my leadership strength was high. And I became really clear that the reason I'd achieve the results I'd done was by developing others into the leadership space. So I was developing leaders around me to deliver results. And, and it was never really about the results itself. I remember talking to my uh, L&D manager at the time, this was at the National Lottery, and saying, how do I do and I do more of this. And she said, well, you you really want my job. <laughs> so from from that space, I I just went on the journey. I, I was really clear what I wanted. Um, I found a concept called Ikigai, which, again, for those people that don't know, it's really a Venn diagram of four things. It's about doing something you love, uh, doing something you're good at, doing something the world needs and something you can get paid for. And if you can achieve all four of those in balance, then it's slap bang in the middle of those Venn diagrams and overlap uh, called Ikigai. And um, so I started doing that every year to keep myself on track and making sure I was doing things I loved. And I found myself after a few years of just putting, putting myself into my job and really uh, working on the art, I think, of developing others uh, leading on leadership and management at the Open University, which was, which is absolutely my dream job. And so when you come to Wikiguy and you're in your own dream job, you're kind of at this point of what happens if I become complacent? What's next if I find what I love? Um, and so in the swing came about because I was like, how could I love what I do more? Uh, and what could the world need more than this? And uh, in my personal life, I had this goal of getting to 60 of the world's of the UK's top 100 golf courses and having a game before I was 60. Uh, I'm I'm early 40s, by the way, so I have quite a lot of time to get there. <laughs> but I was just uh, I was in this job that I loved, but it wasn't getting me any close to that goal. And I was like, why well, is there an overlap between leadership and golf? And um, and so I went on that journey to understand it. And and after a, a good couple of years of testing and understanding the business of in the swing leadership was born. So my journey's been quite a squiggly line, uh, which ended with a really happy story. And then it was actually, how do I not get complacent? And that's what finds me here today. So. That sounds great. I think I think everyone's got, a, like you said, everyone's got a similar story about how they got into learning. It is not something that nat people just naturally go into or not very common for people to naturally just fall into learning. I think they start with somewhere else and then find that passion for helping other people. And I think that's a really important part about being in learning. Um, before you, uh, before we go on to talk about more about your business, etc. Um, when you were thinking about finding that balance in your life, did you not have that balance before? Is that why you kind of desired that? So I think I'd had the privilege uh, of working at, and, and I really need to call out how it really was a privilege. Uh, Organisations like Tesco and the National Lottery are these these places where if you're good and you excel they prom promote really well from within. So there's these really 
really good cultures that gave me the opportunity to progress and I did that really quickly but I found that I was doing what I was perceived to be good at not what I was passionate about um, and so not a criticism of those organizations it was when I moved to that self-actualization that I kind of went actually I want to be more intentional and have a better balance to what I'm doing and what can I do for me and if I take control of what I want to do then I won't be someone that's unhappy in later life. I'm not going to sit there going, oh, well, I'm just going to go to work for another 12 hour day and I don't really know why I'm doing it, but people think I'm good at it. And I, and I, it felt like the right thing for me. And I think increasingly it enables me to be a better supporter of leaders. So one that I've, I've been a senior leader so I can speak the language walk the walk, but also I can understand if they feel a bit jaded and I can probably help them understand what's brought them to that place a little bit so from a coaching perspective it gives me a little more insight yeah I think that I think that's a really good point to make as well for people because you have walked that walk and you have got that empathy and that understanding I think that's a really strong um point and personality trait that you've um kind of made yourself have um so if we go more into your business now that you've just launched um so it's called in the swing what does it actually do yeah, so the, if I do the taglines, the tagline is essentially leadership lessons on the UK's top golf courses. So um, the idea is to look at your leadership practice and capability through the prism of golf. So we offer two core, um, two core products essentially. So one is executive coaching one to one on the golf course, and the beauty of that is you've got a four hour session because the average golf golf round of golf for two people is between four and four and a half hours where you're both experiencing the same experience although your quality of golf might be different you're moving forward you've got a different setting and one of the challenges increasingly for executive coaching particularly online is moving someone out of a, one state and into another when you might just be back to back in another meeting so it's taking someone out of that space and if you want to think differently go somewhere different so executive coaching in that context works quite well but then the second product and certainly the one that gets probably more attention conceptually is about um, a full leadership program so that's spaced across four months it takes in rounds of golf at four different courses and in between time it's supported and that was that was really something that came to the fore and was enabled actually by a really great study by Manchester Metropolitan University. So um, a lot of your, your listeners probably won't have heard of the Good Employment Learning Lab, but um, uh, I spoke to uh, a fabulous uh, professor, uh, Dr. Uh, I don't know if she's a doctor, actually, Julia Rouse at Manchester Met, and they, they looked at what makes effective leadership skills development. And um, so they they said there's essentially three things. And so I can contextualise that as to how our programme does the same thing. So the first thing you would have in a leadership development skills piece is executive coaching. Right, And executive coaching is overarching for the individual to control their narrative. This is what I want to develop. And if you look at it in a business context, they're defining the return on investment they want to get from a programme. And then you support them individually through their learning experience so it's, it, you've got executive coaching so we do that both with an executive coach but we contextualize it as well with a golf pro so that that link is the thing that makes us different so Barney Puttick is our golf pro so he's a fellow of the PGA he's the UK top 25 golf coach and what he does is helps you contextualize yourself in the way you swing a golf club because it's relatively unique for people um, and so you've got this piece about here's my executive coaching target, here's how I swing a golf club, this is how I show up on the golf course, and those two things intertwine, and they they provide this kind of narrative right the way through everything else. The study in Manchester Met wasn't just executive coaching though; it was about a leadership masterclass. So that being like a two-hour workshop would probably be the different that would be the context that we'd we'd all be used to in L and D. And that would really just contextualise your learning. It would give you give the people and your learners a chance to think a bit differently so they can go away and apply their learning. What they said was really you don't you don't get a chance to experiment with that. You just maybe think differently and you need something that's going to take you out of your comfort zone. You're going to think differently. And for that, 
they proposed action learning sets or group coaching sessions, whatever phrase people prefer these days, and they specified something called pulse learning, where someone would bring their issue along, um, they'd share it with the group, the group would then question them for a few minutes, then they'd turn their cameras off, mute themselves, people would discuss their issue, then they'd turn their, their camera back on and say, this is what I heard, this is what I'm going to do differently, and that could cycle through the group. In, a, in our context, golf is played in a four ball, so uh, normally four players together. Um, and that four ball, if you create the right environment, and that's really key because the standard way of playing golf probably doesn't create the right environment. If you create the right environment, you've got a four hour golf coaching group there where people create their own action learning set and they can have really good quality conversations. So. While it sounds like it's a golf day that people will have heard about, what it actually is, is contextualised in real modern research that says this is how you change leadership capability. And in particular, we can match to the needs of senior leaders because it really it does work very similarly, the game of golf and the needs of a senior leader in, in a modern context. So I think like what you're saying, the, the bits beforehand, so where you're talking to your clients essentially and finding out what they need to get out of these sessions, um, that, that bit's really important to you guys because it helps you then set up those days appropriately. So whether it's putting the right people together, um, having the right understanding of what people want to achieve out of these. Do you then kind of summarise those days as well after you've completed it um, to, to really understand what people are getting out of it to kind of not justify it, I don't think it's the right word, but to really get that they've understood why they're there? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in each of those days across the four months, it's a different leadership context. So if I just pick one, just really conscious this isn't one big advert for in the swing people are more than happy to talk to me separately or have a look at the website but if i take one so a, a really key element for senior leaders right now is self-awareness and understanding how through that i impact others and managing that impact so in in the in the lens of in the swing so you would you would have had an executive coaching session where you'll talk about you probably identify the need to talk about your self-awareness, you probably understand a little bit about who's showing up. But when you come to our one of the, the first on-site golf days, for example, you'll meet with the golf pro, Barney will have a look at your golf swing, make you aware of how you're swinging, and that context, how that goes, will help you understand where you are. So for me personally, if I'm a bit tense, I'm trying too hard, my muscles tighten up. So if I'm swinging a golf club, I'll pull it towards me and that makes the ball fly off of the face of the club and go into the woods on the right. Okay, if, if I'm not committing, I might hit the ground beforehand, I might top it or I'll, I might hook it into the water on the left. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'll understand that if it if I'm there's a direct impact to how I'm showing up on the golf course. And so with that in mind, I'm then in this place for the day where I'm really thinking about how I'm showing up today and I can take that learning. And if we've created the right environment, then I'll talk to the other players with me uh, on that day and say, oh, I'm, I'm see I'm doing this and so people start talking about how they're feeling and um, we discovered something that we're calling we're calling seventh hole syndrome um, which is probably the wrong title but we're working on it right so that what what happens is if you create this psychologically safe environment for people to discuss themselves and ultimately that's don't compete so you don't create a competitive environment people don't even need to keep scores and you take alcohol out of the equation two common things that happen on the golf course um, if you do that, then when I'm talking about things, I open up. The first six holes take about an hour and I've probably started moaning about my shoulder being sore, there being a hole in my club or something being wrong, I need a fitting or my shoes hurt or whatever. Uh, and I've, all my excuses are gone and I'm kind of a bit more raw and my arm has gone. And normally on the seventh hole, that's a it's a broad term, but more commonly on the seventh hole, someone will come up with this thing like a revelation about how they're thinking, how they're feeling that they didn't really know they were going to talk about today. And we've had people talk about really personal situations on the seventh tee. And of course, there's 18 holes. They've now got another hour and a half or so to keep talking about these things and encourage others to do it. And then you you create a really psychologically safe environment. And remember, senior leaders will come out of the boardroom and they'll Monday to Friday be full on. They might play golf on a Saturday morning. And most of those Saturday morning golf sessions of competition so i go from competitive environment in the boardroom 
competitive environment in this hobby and so I'm not using it right. So we give people this skill, they can go away and they can repeat and they can they can approach this golf practice intentionally in a way that's better for them. If that makes sense. Yeah, that does make complete sense. Do you think that's why golf is a good sport to be able to do with this with? So for example, like you said, that you you've got one a longer period of time than you do with most other sports, because generally they're a lot less. Um, I guess there's less impact on your body. Um, like, say, if you're going to go and play football, for example, you're going to, it's more physical or whatever, like, or rugby or whatever sport it might be. I think golf is more open to the masses, potentially, um, than other sports um, and less, I guess it's less scary for people to go and play golf rather than, like I said, going to play other things. So do you think that's why it's a good sport to be able to aid learning um, because of those factors? Or do you think there's any more? No, there's, there's quite a few. No, you're right. It's really, yeah, it's really insightful. There's, there's some really core cool things. So golf is one of those sports where you can say you're playing against someone else, but really you're playing yourself. So the the handicap system in golf is really about how many extra shots you'd need to go around a course above what the set par is for it. And I don't I don't want to teach your listeners how to understand golf and they probably don't want to know. But because of the handicap system, I'm really playing against my handicap. So I turn up at this course and it says I need 18 more shots than than the than the course normally would suggest. So on ex- every hole, if it says I should put it down in three, I should put it in the hole by three, I should put it on the hole by four. And if I do more than that, I'm playing worse than I normally would. If I do less than that, I'm playing better. So really I'm only ever competing with myself and the course. Mm-hmm. But because of the way we set up to compete with others, I create a perceived competition. If I take that away, then I'm in my own head. And so 90% of golf is mental. It works really that way. If you take football, I'm always playing against someone. Right? I've got the, the ball in the goal, which means putting it past the goalkeeper. I've got to tackle someone to take the ball off of them. I've got to pass it around them, run the ball past them. You don't have that in golf. It's just me in the hole and all the way from the tee, all the way to where I'm putting in in the hole at the end of, the, at the end of the, that particular hole. It, it's all me and the, and the course. So you're competing against weather and so on. So it's very similar. If you consider senior leadership, it, I'm at the top of the tree. I'm not competing against someone else in my specific field. I'm playing the course, so to speak. So you can you can contextualise the same. It, it is a very unique thing. The length of time you're playing, it's really useful too. I would say it, it, there are other disciplines we would explore, not to ruin future business ideas but for example an executive kitchen for example has very similar setups where you're overlapping with each other and it's a very specialized personal discipline but the overlap's important so there's different disciplines not necessarily sports that work in the same way but golf is definitely a good analogy and there's some really great stuff so just movement in itself and regular physical movement increases brain plasticity, which means people are in a better space to learn or think creativity, creatively or retain information in that space. You've got the OD concept of um, uh, self as an instrument, for example, which is normally used as a, a, a trying to be more dispassionate. But if you consider if I can take myself out of the boardroom context and instead place it in the golf context, the skills I'm using in my head and the mental capability I'm developing, I just transfer that and point it in a different way. I'm just developing my whole self to turn up at the boardroom and apply those lessons. And it, the reason we use top golf courses, any golfer will tell you, is if you go to a golf course which is like a top top golf course you feel no matter who you are like you probably shouldn't be there Mm -hmm. and on the first tee you get wobbly knees you get jelly arms I had this a couple of weeks ago a course I've been dying to play for play on for years I got the chance to go and play at Woburn Golf Club my first shot of the tee was awful and I it took me four holes to recover myself I was playing terribly yeah. I just, so senior leaders don't often get out of their comfort zone very often so being able to take that and then say how do you feel now you're out of your comfort zone gives them something they can go back to the boardroom with I, I think if just staying on the subject of, of comfort zones because obviously in in golf there's a bit of a stigma around who plays golf people doing business on the golf course etc cetera, etc cetera. um and it is generally kind of like white middle-aged people uh, or men predominantly um 
how do you get around that stigma um to attract other people as well into this because if we're talking about senior yeah. leaders it's not just men that are doing that there might be people that don't like golf um that have never played golf so that's kind of I get why you're pulling them out of their comfort zone but how do you get around that barrier that it, it, you've got that stigma you've got those comfort zones that people need to step into or step step out of sorry how do you yeah. how do you get around that or propose to get around that so it, the challenge I guess we have is we can't change the way boardroom setups are and mm. it's it's it, it, it we're on a journey towards equality and trying to get to that space and 90 percent of those in the boardroom in a study in the us play golf right so if you're in the boardroom it's a high likelihood you're a golfer but if you look at the uk stats 79 percent of rounds of golfs played last year were played by men um i don't know the ethnicity breakdown break breakdown but i i think i think it's probably likely to be inherently probably white middle class but that's a guess yeah um but uh so realistically i can't change where we are right now the positive thing is the most the highest growing section of golf right now is the ladies section in golf clubs the, the, the most golf clubs have quite a thriving area and they are growing uh, my daughters uh, are a part of an england golf program called girls golf rocks um so they can they can learn to play golf there so we can't really so we can't as an institution influence the boardrooms across the uk right but we can create an environment where it is open to everyone um it's just really i think it's challenging i think what we're seeing interest so far is it's predominantly men that are interested in it at this moment in time but that's not for the want of trying. It would be lovely for it to be an equal basis. And perhaps some of your listeners might be able to help me um, yeah. reach the right people. Yeah, it's always been a thought um, since we had our initial conversations is around that that kind of stigma, that, that accessibility side of things as well, because as well, not I don't know the research behind this, but generally when we're, we're kind of working with people and learning, it's mainly women um or a lot of women in that learning space so it's like how do you attract um people that are delivering learning or purchasing learning um and then uh obviously matching that with golf as well i think i think it's great i think obviously if you can open up one of the avenues to then um not only help your leadership people um, but also go and give them the skills that they need um, out on to a golf course where you've got access um, to a lot of opportunities to potentially network. I think that's a great, great thing to do. Um, so how there do you is think there is an interesting thing to call out, I guess. So there are really great institutions out there. So, for example, Golf in Society is a charity that operates predominantly in the north of England and Scotland, where they take carers and people with uh, forgive me, I, I think uh, uh, Alzheimer's or dementia um, conditions, and they take them on the golf course together so they can experience things. And they're doing some really great things with outreach. So there's a lady called Kate Johnson. I can't remember the name of her organisation off the top of my head, but she believes people can play golf anywhere. And so she's using it as a way to outreach to different areas of the society. I think my experience so far within the swing leadership is that golf is changing and approaching new areas of society i just think like the boardroom challenges at the moment it's it's a journey that isn't going to happen overnight and so if there's anything we can do to be part of that journey we're absolutely on board um at this moment in time it's around giving leaders a new context to understand where they are um, but we haven't ruled out how we can do women in leadership programs or 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 other other reaching wider reaching projects further down the line that makes sense yeah no and i i think it's a great thing because i think you've got lots of um pluses to it as well like you you kind of mentioned like the being out in the open exercise and i'm sure that's massively helpful for well-being as well like getting people out exercising because like i said before doing other sports is extremely difficult to get mm. those other pieces that are crucial into leadership um to do that well because like you said it's always a competitive nature i know that like, i was thinking about things that you could potentially do and i was like running running you do that yourself i've taken up running this year and it, it's me against myself but you can't talk and run at the same time and you're not having that <laughs> conversation um so you know like i was just trying to think of other examples and, and there's not loads that you are able to do so i think i think like i'm a big sports fan so i think giving people that opportunity 
um and giving people the access you're opening up lots of uh lots of avenues and and, and you're helping out in lots of things in their lives as well and not the, just that leadership bit the only limitation to our methodology is broadly you'd want someone to have played golf for about a year before they took on one of our projects okay. because you want you want something because if we teach you how to swing a golf from the beginning it's like me a golf club from the beginning it's like me telling you exactly how you're supposed to manage from the beginning yeah if you've got your own style you've got your own approach then it's something unique to you and you'll probably get more from our programs it doesn't mean that we can't work with someone early doors it just means that i think it would probably lose a little bit of that self-awareness if I've told you how to swing a golf club. If you've gone and learned and then we help you contextualise it, it's probably a little richer. So it's it's a, it's an interesting area for us. Yeah, I guess because if you're d dealing with people that are managers already, they've already played golf, then you're getting them to understand that you can kind of unlearn things. Um, and tweak yeah. things and relearn yeah, yeah. things. So I think they're the bits that are important, aren't they? It's is and that, that that's acceptable as well. Mm -hmm. So how do you think golf's helped you personally? So it, it's been so obviously we work in a creative creative industry in in learning and development. Our job is predominantly to find a solution to a new challenge and skills development and we probably need to find a new way of looking at it quite often to help a slightly different outcome. Um, I started uh, the concept for In The Swing at a point where we were coming out of lockdown and I really needed an opportunity to just get out of my own head and think and so I spoke to a group of friends I hadn't seen for a while also in in senior positions and said can we anyone fancy taking up golf again and we we just started having conversations on the course so what it what it does for me is whether I'm in a group of people or whether I go and play on my own is I can go away I can understand how I'm showing up today I can understand what's going on and I can then choose to take action I find that if I'm struggling to get something away at work I go to the golf range or I go to the golf course I can really quickly understand, I'll, I'll contextualise it as a little bit, is it just me forcing it or am I not committing or what is going on? Then when I can start to get to that point, then I can take action. OK, if I'm not committing, what am I not committing to? What do I need to do? What could I do? What could step to do? And then the two hours when I come away from the range or off the golf course after that, I do the amount of work I would normally do in a week in those two hours because I've had that chance to think I've gone somewhere different. I've thought differently and I've taken action because I kind of send to myself. So it's it's a fundamental part of my practice now. So my wife, for example, she she'll do aerobic activity. She'll either go for a run or she'll go on a rowing machine and she uses that for her well-being. Well, part of my well-being practice mentally and physically is to make sure that every week I play some golf because it, it just centres me and brings me back down to where I am. It's made me a, a much more complete leader. It's made me able to take on challenges much, much easier because I contextualise them on the golf course. So it just it just takes a bit of the pressure out. Plus, my networks are stronger. I'm talking to people that I probably never would have done before. Um, so it's been really powerful for me. I think it's all those soft skills that we kind of take for granted, um, especially in those stressful periods in your life where you kind of might want to close yourself away a little bit more. Um, like if you are doing a project at work, for example, and you're not really sure where to go with it, I think getting away and having that space is really important. Um, and some people don't know how to do that because they they don't necessarily have that that opportunity to do that. So I think as well, like you said, creating that for yourself is really important and then opening that up to other people would be really important as well and, um, and so, so those relationships i make on the course because i'm not competing with them i'm changing the conversation and we're able to be far more open it's it's a really useful space for well-being i i also think focus is really helpful so it's quite a long stick and it's a very small ball you can't you can't be distracted and be able to hit it where you want to hit it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a great golfer. My my job 
in in the swing leadership isn't to be the best golfer you've ever met it's actually to be a very average golfer and I'm very good at being very average um some yeah. days and so it, it it's actually about understanding what what I need to do to fully commit today and and it, if I can't fully commit what's holding me back and, and it's a really useful thing because I, I can't be successful in either context if I don't commit so it, mm. if I can fix it in one of those instances I'll be better in the other one and it's it's just seeing that it, it, my whole self comes to work every day my whole self goes to the golf course my whole self takes the kids to school and picks them up it's I'm able to just understand this is what's going on I don't tend to try and put things to the back of my mind anymore I just have to deal with it otherwise it, there's an impact it's yeah. been quite beneficial for me that's really great. And I think if you're you're able to then share that out with other people as well, I think listening to your story and, and how it's inspired you to create the business, but also to listen to your story about how um, golf as a sports helped you not only uh, in your kind of personal life, but in your working life as well. I think um, using that to then be able to to kind of sell that to other people is really powerful um, because it, you're kind of proving that it works as well. Yeah, thank you. So what does your future look like for yourself and, and for In The Swing? Well, I, I've given up uh, getting on the pro tour, um, so I'm unlikely to be a professional golfer anytime soon. <laughs> so I, I guess I'd better focus on leadership development. Um, so I'm really fascinated by different concepts that people can use to advance their leadership capacity. So we want to make In The Swing more accessible as we go and, and it's about at the moment we're focused on senior leaders because we believe that's probably where the biggest bang for the buck is for people's development initially then we want to then develop programs that are more accessible at the beginning of your leadership career and simpler for people we 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 kind of want to be a bit for everyone and i would really love for us to have enough success to go down the route of being able to give back to some of the really great golf charities that are around there that increase reach so we're we're in early days at the moment we're in our first full year of operations so we it, we're a little way off of building enough of a bandwidth for us to to get there but i i definitely didn't get into L and D to become a millionaire, as most people have found. <laughs> My, the job for me is I really want to change the way people interact with golf because there's so much more it can do for them. And at the moment, it, it people are competing when they could do it something else. And I'd really like to show people the way. It's that knowledge of psychological safety and how you can create an environment which is really enriching for you. You can compete as well, right? But knowing what you need and then going and be more intentional. So there's that, and then. And then it would be nice to understand if there are other settings where our in the swing concept can work and working with with coaches and specialists in sports or or other disciplines. I mentioned cooking, for example, I, I'm, I quite like the idea of taking over commercial kitchen with senior leaders and and seeing how they overlap. And it, but first things first, it's it's making sure that in the swing has a legacy to, to run and, and we do something really good in this country and possibly beyond with the concept. That sounds awesome. So if people want to find out more about In The Swing, how to get in touch with you, how do they go about doing so? So we've got a website, uh, intheswingleadership.com. Uh, we also are on LinkedIn uh, as our primary channel of communication where we try and share leadership contextualised stuff. Um, and I'm more than happy for people to reach out and connect with me in either space, either through our inquiry form on our website or directly through LinkedIn. We're at a stage where we really like to talk to people. And in the L&D sphere, I, I'd like to think I'm giving a gift to some of those L&D uh, heads of L&D who, who struggle to get into the boardroom because maybe they're not as engaged with learning. And so maybe potentially the nugget of someone getting to play some really nice golf at the same time as learning leadership might help them. Um, but equally, we are we are research led, so we we know what we deliver. So if someone wants to get in touch and has any ideas or, or any queries, I'd really love to talk to them. That's awesome. And we'll put your website in our show notes below. And I wish you all the best of luck for In The Swing going forward. It sounds like a really awesome concept and uh, hopefully lots of people get on board with it. Thank you so much, Katie. It's been lovely to be here today. Cheers. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Learning Reinvented podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. If you've not already done so, please follow our podcast. 
And if the learning effect can help you and your organisation, please do get in touch. You can find both James and Katie on LinkedIn and our contact details are in the show notes below.